All right. Thank you. So the outline of today's talk. So the first thing I'd like to do is to tell you, um, great, thank you. So the first thing I'd like to do is to tell you about the program's aims. So what are we trying to achieve with you uh, in the MSc language education and the structure of the program? So what are the courses in semester one, in semester two? So you get a feel of what you're going to do with us next year. Um, then I'll tell you a bit about the reputation of the University of Edinburgh. Um, obviously, you've heard of the University of Edinburgh. It has a very high reputation, but I want to tell you exactly why, on what basis, and especially the reputation of the School of Education where you will be based. And Farah will tell you a bit about um, the location. So. Where is the university campus? You know, to show you pictures of um, the city of Edinburgh, which is a beautiful city. So it's a real bonus. Um, and then we'll end the talk about uh, sharing some of the social programs, some of the activities we do as a group uh, to get to know each other throughout the year. And then you'll have time uh, to ask questions. Okay, so the main aim of the MSc language education is to equip you to teach the languages that you know. So you come to the program with languages that you speak, that you're fluent in, that you're happy to communicate in. So this could be your first language, it could be a foreign language, an additional language, and then and we teach you how to use these languages in a language educational role. So you can take on as well additional roles in the field of language education. So what are these additional roles? So usually we think of language education as being just about teaching a language, but what we're going to show you today is actually there is far more to language education than just teaching a language. Um, there are roles in, for instance, designing assessment, or planning curriculum, or managing a school, managing a language school, or evaluating and designing teaching materials, and also aspects of um, language policy and language planning. So, for instance, what languages are allowed as a medium of instruction in an educational environment. So the aim of the program is also to develop your knowledge and understanding of three key points. The first one is, I like to see them as the three pillars of the program. So the first one is how we learn a language. The second one is how we use languages in our daily life how diff when we use a language in particular situation, our use might be different, our choice of words might be different, our style, our register might be different. And then the third pillar is how best to teach languages. So this is the area of uh, teaching methodology of pedagogy. And then the third aim of the program is to tailor courses to your academic and professional needs. So we bring uh, research-led teaching, but we try to adapt it as much as we can to your professional needs, to your context. So it's very much tailored to who you are, your profile when you come to the program. And it is based on the latest research trends. So some of the highlights uh, of the program, the strength of the program, if you'd like, um, it is a small group. So you will see that uh, in some other programs, it's very large cohort of students. Uh, we pride ourselves that this program is actually a small cohort of between 30 and 40 students. So it's a really nice size. We get to know each other very well. The teaching staff would like to think of ourselves as being friendly, uh, approachable, um, dynamic, and we're also all very much multilingual. So as you can hear from my accent, perhaps, um, French is my first language, and English is my second uh, language. Farah, 
and mm -hmm. I speak Bahasa Malaysia. That's my first language, mm -hmm. and English is my second language. So yeah, I think Bi bilingual like, as well. Yeah, most of us are. Yeah, are bilingual. So a lot of us um, speak multiple languages, and we have taught uh, multiple languages as well. So we are experienced language teachers. We're also a vibrant research uh, community, so we are all research active. So what we mean by that is, in addition to teaching, we also run our own research projects. Um, and all our teaching is informed by the research that we do ourselves, and as well by all the research that is happening in the language education academic community. Um, we hold conferences, uh, we give talks at international conferences, so we're very much on the, very active on the research scene as well. Um, another highlight of the program as well is that um, although we are based in the School of Education, we also collaborate with two other centres in the University of Edinburgh, which are very well known in the field of language education. One of these centres is called the Centre for Open Learning, and this is where a lot of modern foreign languages are being taught. And the second centre is called the Linguistics and English Language Department, uh, which is actually the first department in linguistics in the UK. So we have very strong collaborations with them, and I'll tell you a bit more how that collaboration works when I tell you about our courses. And the last highlight I'd like to mention today um, is that we that our students have the uh, possibility to observe language classes. So as part of one of our courses, we give our students the possibility, the opportunity to go in a real language class of their choice and to observe uh, how that language is being taught and also to volunteer if they want as a language um, teacher. So a lot of practical opportunities as well in this program. So you might be asking yourself, um, is the program uh, for me? Which is a, a fair enough question. Um, so the program is for you, I would say, if um, you have an undergraduate degree um, in a language degree. So this doesn't have to be English, um, it can be Mandarin, or it can be Spanish, or any languages, uh, but if you have a language degree, uh, that's a real uh, advantage to study with us. The programme is for you as well, if one of your ambitions is to develop your understanding of pedagogy, and by pedagogy we mean teaching methodology, so how to teach uh, a language. And also, I believe that the program is for you if um, you are a language teacher already. So some of our students um, are existing language teachers and they go back to studying with us to do a master's to then take on an additional role, a step up in their career, like a management role, for instance, in the field of uh, language education. So as I said before, you will come with an expertise in one or more languages um, and you will receive cutting edge uh, in knowledge in language education in order to be able to teach um, that language and to participate in all the peripheral activities around language education, such as curriculum planning, language policy, assessment, etc. So how is the program um, structured? Um, so obviously being called language education, um, we all have a passion for language and a passion for education and we hope to share that passion uh, with you. Um, in semester one, so we're trying to divide the year into kind of three semesters. The first semester is September to Christmas. And this is when you do what we call 
compulsory courses. So these are courses that you have to do and they give you the foundation to then move on to semester two and specialize in an area of your choice. So the three, um, sorry, the four compulsory courses we have, um, the first one is called Language Under Learner. And this one corresponds to the first pillar I was talking about, if you remember earlier. So the first pillar was how we learn a language. So this is exactly what this course does. It tells you how we learn a language, how we learn a first language, and that how that's different when we learn a second, a foreign, or an additional language. The second course um, is called Professional Practice. And this course is taught by members of staff in the um, Center for Open Language Learning, which I mentioned, so it's the, the other center. So they are teaching this course, and it's about how to teach languages. So you remember, it was one of the, the second pillars, how we teach languages. And in this course, this is where you do your um, language class observations and you also get a chance to go to visit Scottish schools. So if you're not familiar with how the educational system works in the UK, for instance, it's a fantastic opportunity to go for two days in a primary school or a secondary school and see how languages are taught in that context. So this is part of that course. And then the third course is called Language, Education and Society. And this is the third pillar of the programme, which is about how we use languages. So how we use languages according to our agenda, according to our age, uh, if we might use different varieties of languages, different accents, um, etc. So this course touches on what we call issues in applied linguistics and also social linguistics. Um, and then the fourth course is um, a research method course, uh, which gives you again the foundation on uh, how to design um, uh, a research project, um, how to design research questions, how to choose research methodologies. And the aim of those courses is to help you do your dissertation at the end of the matters. So I'll tell you a bit more about the dissertation afterwards. After Christmas, we move on to um, semester two. Um, which is the option courses. So this is an exciting time when you get to choose two option courses in the list here that you have. So I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes for you to have a look at all the courses you we offer uh, on the programme. So as you can see, um, we offer a, a variety of option courses and we all have someone in our team who has strong expertise in each of these courses. So these courses are taught by staff, members of staff who are experts in those areas. And as I said, you can choose two uh, option courses. Sometimes one of these option courses does not run uh, in a particular year if that member of staff is either on sabbatical, um, but we offer the majority uh, of these courses. So when you do your option course, um, it's a time when, um, as a learner, as a student, you you're starting to specialize in a particular area of language education. And when you specialize, we ask you to keep in mind two things. First, 
what do you want to do for your dissertation as a research project? What do you want to really um, know in depth? And then the second thing as well is think of your career. So think long term. What do you think will be most helpful to you in your context um, to find the job that you really want to do or the position, the step up that you're really aiming for? And then you can choose that option course uh, on, on this basis as well. And then once you've done the, the option courses, um, that's when the dissertation course uh, happens. And in my view, this is the most exciting part of the masters. Um, why? Well, because this is a time where you have a few months where you can really get to know a particularly, particular topic of your choice in depth and you're not on your own. You have the help of a supervisor who has expertise in that area and who is there for you. You meet them six times face to face on an individual basis. So you have quite a close working relationship with the supervisor and they're really there to help you guide you into the reading you should be doing and how to design how to collect your data how to analyze it and um, it gives you a lot of ownership and pride i think once you've done your own research project and you develop expertise as well in the area um, of your choice so a very exciting uh time the dissertation course. And it is challenging, yeah, thank you for your comment. Um, it is challenging, it's true. Um, yes, it is challenging, uh, but in a positive way, uh, in the sense that it's uh, very stimulating, motivating, um, because you have all this knowledge that you've acquired in semester one and semester two, and now you can look at a particular phenomenon on your own, uh, by yourself rather, not on your own, by yourself, and then with the help of um, uh, a supervisor. And then uh, some of our students actually um, like the dissertation so much uh, that they realize, oh, actually, I enjoy research mm -hmm. a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And um, then they want to apply to do a PhD. I mean, that's what happened to me. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a, it's a very good um, little experience yeah. um, to see whether do I like research? Um, am I um, enthused by it? And mm. if you are, that it sort of gives you an idea why I, I, actually I, I'm going to try and do a PhD. And I, I like, I like probably want to, to do that. Yeah. So I think it's a very, very good little piece of um, time for you to sort of reflect hmm, maybe his PhD. Is a PhD Next, for me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. For me, yeah. That's right. Okay. Um, yes, and we're proud to say as well that um, one of our previous students uh, was awarded a Baliap Master's a Dissertation Award uh, for her dissertation entitled Can Academic Reading Empower EAP Students? Um, and she submitted that in 2017. And if you're interested in seeing her abstract of what it look, what an amazing dissertation looks like, you can click on that uh, link. So we're very proud uh, of that. Okay, so then moving on to um, the reputation of uh, the university and our, how, we're, how well are we doing in terms of research and teaching. Um, so as you know, uh, the University of Edinburgh is one of the world's leading research universities and it's ranked uh, fourth in the UK for research power. Um, and in terms of teaching, we are very committed to high quality and innovative teaching. So we do use different methods, we use uh, different modes of teaching, online, face-to-face -face, or blended learning. Um, to help you reach uh, your full potential. So we're aware that our students have different ways of learning, different profiles, um, what we call uh, multiple intelligences. Um, so we try and make sure that when we deliver our teaching, 
that we are doing this in a way that fits a variety of learning profiles as well. And we encourage our learners to develop autonomous learning as well, to become um, autonomous learners, independent learners. Um, and so we have a lot of spaces for you to study independently as well. Uh, amazing libraries. We've got a library on campus in Murray House. Uh, we have a main library in the kind of the George Square area, which is the kind of old part of the university. Um, and we also have a personal tutor scheme, uh, which I think is, works really well. Mm -hmm. um, so when you arrive on the program, you're allocated a personal tutor. So it's a member of staff. So it could be me, it could be Farah, it could be anyone else in the team. Um, and you meet this personal tutor uh, individually three times a year. And the personal tutor is there to give you academic advice, but also personal advice if, if you have any issues affecting your studies. Because um, sometimes um, some of you come from far away, you're away from home, it's a long time. Uh, sometimes uh, it can be a bit difficult. So we're there to make sure that your experience with us is uh, as, uh, as possible, really. Um, and the feedback we had from our students is usually very positive about this scheme. And it's a great way for us as well uh, to get to know you as well, really well. Um, yeah. Our research uh, rating. So uh, the MSc Language Education is based in the Moray House School of Education. And that School of Education has received the largest award for education research in Scotland. So we did really well. And the second largest in the UK, uh, in the most recent UK government research assessment exercise. So every five years, all universities are assessed as to the level of quality and output they're producing in terms of research and then they're ranked. Uh, so in Scotland, uh, the School of Education has received the largest award for education research. Uh, we're also happy to have uh, two professors teaching on our programme. Professor John Joseph, who teaches the course called Issues in Applied Linguistics. So you have heard his uh, name, he's really well known. He's published a lot in issues of language and politics. Uh, language and identity and he's a great professor and really approachable too. Uh, recently as well uh, Professor Do Coyle joined our team and we're very pleased uh, that she has. She's very dynamic and her expertise is on uh, what we call CLIL uh, which stands for Content and Language Integrated Learning. So even if you want to find out about her work, she's published widely. She's really the world expert on uh, this new way of teaching languages. If you look on YouTube for Professor Do Coyle, you'll see a lot of videos of her work, uh, what she does, uh, and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, all of us, uh, our staff, so we're a staff of 12, 13, uh, uh, academics. We all publish in international journals and we present our work at national and international uh, conferences. And in fact this year um, I'm organizing the Language Policy Forum which is part of the British Association of Applied Linguistics so you can see the logo at the bottom of your screen here and it's going to be held at Edinburgh and we're going to uh, have over 120 presentations uh, with participants coming from all over the world so very we're very much looking forward to that and every year there is an event like that that we're participating in okay so now we're going to move to uh, something a bit more fun about talking oh. about the location of Edinburgh. Yeah, well, gosh, where, where do we start with Edinburgh? It's such an exciting city to be in. Now, Edinburgh has got a lot of um, attractions. If you like to look at you know, old buildings, old architecture, uh, you know, it, we have it. We're very, very lucky to be um, situated within the old 
town of Edinburgh yeah. um, um, uh, um, at Moray House. So, so that's very interesting. It's a lot of um, interesting buildings, a lot of old architecture. Um, so the picture that you have here, I think it's of um, Colton Hill. Yeah. Sits up top um, over the hill, and we can actually see this from from our from our, our faculty, our department here. So, so that will be the uh, interesting buildings. If you want to go into the parks, we've got lots of greeneries around Edinburgh as well. So, what we have here, we've got the Princess Garden, um, a very, very interesting and relaxing place to just go and sit and chill. It looks really nice and sunny over over the summer. Um, and I think um, in this picture, it overlooks some of the, um, I think, Scots monument on the left. Mm. Um, and then I think we can and see we're just the, here. We're, we're just here on the right hand side. Mm. So uh, I think that if you can see, I think that's a railway, the Waverley um, train station. So we're very central. We're very, very central. It mm. is beautiful. I mean, I don't think the picture here doesn't do justice. You have to be here to have um, to see. Um, I think we also have not just. Oh, well, there you go. That is what we have actually today as well. We have a bit of um, snow. A bit of snow, to yeah. Today, so the picture on the right-hand side, that's actually the castle that sits at the top of the hill with um, um, some snow powdered all around it. And this is what we have today. It is amazing, amazing view. So this is perhaps, uh, I think, if we, if we are in the city, we get to see the ruins, we get to see the castle. Um, if you want to go up to the highlands, we do have lots of mountains and hills as well. Beautiful. Um, we're not too far away from the beach as yeah. well. So yeah, it's a yeah. Edinburgh is a historical city. Um, so let's have a look and see. Right, we have a really healthy cafe culture. <laughs> uh, beautiful cakes. There's a lot of different sorts of um, cafes around. Um, if you are into J.K. Rowling. Um, yeah. So we've got um, I think two cafes um, around Edinburgh very close by to each other where she sat down at some point in the past to write um, Harry Potter and the novels of Harry Potter. Mm. Um, definitely the place of foodie, yes, there's lots of different kinds of food. Um, come over and try haggis, so that will be the specialty in, um, in Scotland. Um, so yes, healthy, healthy cafe culture, you can actually you go from one cafe to another. Um, in Moray House we have a cafeteria called Levels. Um, this is a very um, relaxing place to to come and to eat. Um, there's also some workspaces where you can um, mm. you know sit down and do your work. Um, there's free Wi-Fi all around the cafe, um, and the cafe serves I think very interesting food. Sometimes it's very international. Okay, sometimes you have Asian food, you have um, English food, you have Scottish food. Um, I can tell you for sure there's a few times where they have Malaysian food as well. So oh, lovely! Mm. Very very nice to be um, to be at. Um, Yes, of course, there's lots and lots of uh, events that occur throughout the year. Um, I think this picture perhaps came from um, Hogmanay, mm -hmm. uh, where we have um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of beautiful um, fireworks, fireworks um, mm -hmm. that happens um, on New Year's Eve. We do have the Fringe Festival that is very, very um, famous all around the world. So that I think um, in August, in August mm -hmm. where um, artists, um, street artists or theatre um, performers will come to Edinburgh to perform their pieces. Uh, so that's a very, very interesting um, time to come to Edinburgh. Mm. And of course, we do have the um, sports facility, a very, very good sports facility, world-class sports facility here, um, which is very close again to um, um, the Morrow House. Um, we've got the, um, now I'm not very familiar, what do we, what do we call this, the climbing Yes, uh, uh, climbing frame, uh, yeah, yeah, and we've got a gym as well, climbing wall. And I think, yeah, we, yeah it's opposite our building. We do have even the swimming pool. Yeah, yeah. So uh -huh. a, a plenty of places for you to stay healthy and stay, and to stay fit, and also an opportunity for you to go and, and make friends, really. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we encourage you to. Um, obviously, the Masters is an intensive year, but we encourage you to try and keep a balanced life and to uh, maintain one of the hobbies that you really like. So for some of you, it might be uh, swimming or hill walking or going to the gym. Um, but what we're trying to say is there's a lot to happen uh, that happens in Edinburgh and that can um, help you keep that uh, balance yeah. whilst you yeah. study with us. And yeah. all the time at your doorstep. So you're exactly. not too far away from everything. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Farah. Um, and then 
um, the last thing I wanted to say as well is uh, to talk about a bit about the, our social program. Uh, so because we are a smaller group, um, we are able to um, meet together uh, throughout the year, not just to talk about work or your studies, but just also to hang out and get to know each other. And a lot of our students make very strong uh, friendships throughout the year with us. So at the start of the year, sometimes we offer um, a Kaylee, Kaylee dancing. This is a typical Scottish dance, uh, which we model for you. So it's quite easy to follow and it's a lot of fun. Um, in winter, uh, we tend to go uh, ice skating. So even if you've never gone ice skating before, it's fine. It's a lot of fun. Um, and it's uh, right in the middle of the center by the Christmas market. Uh, so it's very Christmassy. Uh, and lovely. Um, and then by uh, uh, kind of springtime, uh, we tend to organize what we call the potluck lunch, um, which is where everyone brings a, a dish that they really, they want to share with others. So it can be either homemade or just something that you bought in the supermarket, doesn't matter. Um, but students tend to sometimes uh, make an effort and cook something traditional from uh, where they're from and share that with others. And then in the summer, um, we go hill walking, a gentle hill walking, nothing too strenuous. Uh, and this is a picture of one of the seven hills of Edinburgh. So this is taken from a hill called Blackford Hill. And you can see uh, in the horizon uh, this kind of massive hill, which is called Arthur's Seat. And if you look just behind Arthur's Seat, you can see the sea, right? And then on the left hand side of the hill is where uh, Moray House is. So this is where the campus is based, so very central. Okay, and at the end of the year, um, if you meet all the requirements, uh, you get to graduate. And this is what graduation uh, looks like. And it's a lot of fun. And it's in a, a beautiful historic building uh, called McEwen Hall. All right. So um, I think this is uh, probably now time for us to stop doing the talking and uh, make sure that you have time to ask us uh, questions. So you can use the, the, the chat box on the right hand side. I can see that uh, quite a lot of you have left uh, messages. I can't see if there are any questions there. Oh, that's one there. Is there a question here? The course has more emphasis on language or education by Oh yeah, that's a that's a question here. Um, well, okay, that's a very good question actually. So does the course have more emphasis on language or education? I would find it hard to separate the two really. Um, you can do an MSc in education, which is education in its broad sense. You could do an MSc in language or linguistics where you just focus on language. What we try and do here is bridge the two. So it's language education as one thing, language education. But obviously to teach language education, we need to tell you a bit about education, a bit about language and how, and then about all the peripheral things around language education that it's not just about language teaching as well. Um, so it's also about understanding how we use language, uh, how we learn language, um, and different uh, methods of how to teach languages. So I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, yeah. And then I'm going to go through your messages and see if there are any new questions. Um, Right, you're welcome. Any new questions? Oh, I can see one here at the bottom. I've noticed there are three accommodations mm -hmm. in campus. Which one is near Moray House? Oh, right. So we're from behind our building. Yeah. I'm not sure what's, what's called. That's a good question. I wonder if um, Aiko could help you with that. Um, oh yes, yeah. so Aiko has kindly put 
a link um, with where to find accommodations. Um, because the, the campus is so central, so if you look at a map of Edinburgh, you have the castle, and you've got the main high street with all the tourist shops that go down like that, and we're at the bottom of that street. So we're so central. So all the university accommodations tend to be central as well, really. Thank you, Aiko, for all the information you're writing here. Right, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions that you might think of? Oh. <laughs> the weather. Ah, could you tell us something about the weather? It's exciting and interesting. You it's can interesting. have yeah. <laughs> I mean, predominantly, it's it's cold. Cold in winter. Um, in winter. Mm. We've got very nice weather during the summer months. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, somebody has come from the Asian countries. I think it's very interesting when you come to um, Edinburgh because sometimes you can get different seasons in a day. Yeah. You can have, you know, the sun can come out. You can then have a bit of rain and then you can have some hail and sometimes sleet and some snow all within the same day. Yeah. But predominantly, I think we don't get that much of snow. Um, it, it tends to be cold, the cold winter, but not cold winter. to the extent yeah. that, you know, we, we, we're not, I think we don't get snow. Yeah. Um, I think it's pretty mild in a way that it, it, there isn't extreme yeah. weather. No, it's not an extreme weather no. because we're by the sea, mm. so it never gets really cold. Uh, oh. Um, Yes, Aiko, if you can show the view from, from my window, that'd be great. Oh, it's nice and nice sunny. If I show a video from Farah's office view. Yeah. Okay, go for it, Aiko. Can you do that? I think the snow sort of melted from this morning. Yeah. But it's um, very nice and sunny. So I guess I would say that um, uh, winters are really crisp. So it's very kind of cold and crispy, and but very bright. So bright blue skies, lots of lights. Um, yeah, oh, it's a reference statement. Um, yeah, it feels like I think what's worth mentioning, talking about the weather as well, is the quality of the air. So I don't know where you're all from. But um, I come from, I was brought up in a very, in a capital city in Paris, and uh, the quality of the air was very poor, so there a lot of pollution. Whereas here, because we're by the sea and by the hills, it feels very fresh, mm. and the quality of the air is excellent. So mm. there's something very fresh, fresh and healthy. Is, yeah. yeah, I don't know if that helps. Um, oh, I can see other questions. So, as for reference statements, do you accept only academic ones or can it be one academic letter and one letter from um, a company? Yeah, so we can, if you are working, uh, so if you are if you have experience of being a language teacher or whatever, then we do accept references from uh, your employer. So you can have an academic letter and then um, a letter from your employer. Yes, of course, that would be really good. Um, all right, so then there's another question about, I also applied for a seven week EAP course, um, which is, thank you for mentioning that, um, because that's something I wanted to tell you about. So um, sometimes when you receive an offer from the University of Edinburgh, it says uh, that it, con it is conditional on your English. So that means you need to set the IELTS test, for instance, and reach a particular level. Um, 
to help you reach uh, that level and to meet that condition, um, the University of Edinburgh offers um, English language courses uh, that are specialized uh, to help you um, uh, learn the type of English we need in academia and in particular for masters in languages or education. Uh, these courses are called pre-sessional English classes and they are run by the English Language Education Centre and uh, we will send you an email about that and we are very lucky this year because the English Language Education Centre has agreed to reserve 20 spaces for the MSc Language Education applicants uh, until the end of March. So if you are wanting to study with us but you still have to get your English to the required level, I would strongly encourage you to book your space as soon as possible because these are very popular courses and they get filled up really quickly. So to avoid any disappointment, I would strongly encourage you if, that's, if you are in that position um, to book uh, a space now. Um, regarding your question about visa, I can see that ICO has put a link about uh, that. Uh, I'm afraid it's not really my uh, area, so you would need to get proper advice from the department that deals with immigration and visas. Um, the next question is how to minimum the barriers when some students cannot master the target languages, especially... Oh yeah, so it's about how to get English language support, is that question? So we, I guess it's important to say that um, uh, quite a lot of our students are international students um, and for whom English is not the first language. We have also a lot of uh, uh, students from the UK or from the US, um, but the majority of our students are international students. So you wouldn't be the only one for whom English is not the first language. And we are aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, we very much try to provide as much support as we can and also we work very closely with the center I was talking about, so English Language Education Center, and they run courses before the master starts, so the pre-sessional courses that I was talking about, but then they also offer courses throughout the year that are free courses to help you build your English academic mm -hmm. skills. Mm -hmm. And they give specific courses such as how to write an essay in English or how to give a presentation in English, for instance. So mm -hmm. these are very helpful. Uh, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure I understand this question. Um, as for the topic selecting, are there any requirements about the graduation paper of bachelor's degree? Um, I, um, Lou, are you referring to the option courses? Um, I don't know. Topic selecting. As for the, so or for the dissertation, about, perhaps? Uh, about the graduation paper. So, I'm not, we're not sure if we understand your question, but if you're meaning that... Oh, um, I suppose, does that mean your bachelor's degree, which area you specialise, or yeah. um, is there any... Um, issues with the sort of specialization in the degree level right. and if you know with regards to that um, into coming into the master's program here mm. if that's if, if mm. we got it right so do we have any pre-requirements to do a particular option course or any pre-requirements to do a dissertation topic for instance um, which we don't so yes. uh, okay thank you so basically once you're admitted on the program um, you have access to all the courses. So there is no pre-requirements, right? Mm -hmm. So if you get a, an offer, then you're fine. Uh, you have access to all the courses I talked about today. 
but I'm not sure if he was referring to as to her undergraduate degree mm -hmm. if what she has graduated in what you know if she graduated in marketing for example is you know what will she be able to um join in uh, masters in education i'm sorry uh, oh. language education uh, i think that's what she refer she's referring to um but she's not saying anything at the moment you said yes, yes. for what we had said i think okay so, so that's I think we may okay, have well, that. if we've answered, yes, if we haven't, please write back, uh, you know, and ask this more. Mm. And then we have a question about scholarship, uh, scholarship or funding. Um, and um, if you are a uh, home student, so what we call by home is that if you have a UK citizenship uh, or if you have an European citizenship, um, uh, then you have access to a scholarship uh, for the MSc language education and more information is given in the link that Aiko has just posted, posted there. Um, I think this year we have eight scholarships to share among three programs so it is a little bit competitive so make sure that you know your your statement letter is strong your support letter is strong and then um, all the details are on that link including the deadline for your submissions. And yeah, so for international students, um, as Aiko said, uh, we recommend students to seek out their own scholarship uh, opportunities. So we put all of our um, all the links that we have on our website. Uh, but then sometimes uh, your home country also has scholarships to fund you to study abroad. That's possible as well. So you can look what we offer, but it's also good to look at what your country offers. Graduate paper. So, so Lewis referring to again her um, undergraduate degree. Is that right, Lou? Are you referring to your undergraduate degree? And if your undergraduate degree um, um, will uh, will enable you to get into the MSc language education, I mean, that's what Lou is referring to. Could mm. you tell me more about the undergraduate paper? So, I suppose undergraduate qualification her certificate mm -hmm. of her degree mm -hmm. so um the i guess we can talk about the requirements right yeah of uh, the entry requirements uh to get an offer on the msc language education so i don't know if you want to tell so a ideally you want somebody um with language um qualifications so who's done language in the first degree um however if you don't have that um, if you do have experience as a teacher, uh, we'll look into that as well. We're very um, open. Um, we would like to encourage as many uh, you know, uh, students who are inspired to be teachers. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the, um, your undergraduates not in language or language teaching, but you do have experience, um, we'll, we're very open. We'll look at it. Um, it is going to be by you know, case by case basis. I'll have a look at it. And then, um, yeah, and we'll get in touch um, mm. as to, you know, um, or if that's possible or not. Um, I hope that's what you're referring to, Lou. So don't be, mm. don't be put off if you don't have um, an undergraduate degree in, in language or teaching. Mm. If you do have um, the experience, um, mm. please do get in touch. Exactly. And I think what you're saying, Farah, answers uh, this question as well. I'm not reading students' names. Uh, uh, so someone is asking, do students who are not majoring in languages but really love education and language teaching have mm -hmm. the opportunity to receive offers? And the answer is yes, right? So we'll look at your application and yes, we'll definitely look at your application um, and see your level of uh, motivation. If, you're made, if your major is not in languages, then we'll look at how much experience do you have uh, of volunteering or teaching. We'll look at your statements, uh, your support letter, 
um, and so we'll definitely consider your application. And then, so we have uh, five minutes because I'm aware that we need to leave the room at 12 to make time and space for the next session to start. So I'm just going to um, uh, take those uh, last two questions. Um, so one of the question is, do we need uh, some related knowledge about doing research? And the answer is very simple, is no. You don't need to know anything about research to be successful in the program. Uh, we provide all the training you need um, and then you do build up knowledge, you acquire knowledge as you go along uh, the program and then towards the end of the year when you do the dissertation, you have all the tools you need uh, to do a successful dissertation. And then uh, the last question is, uh, yes, are there opportunities for students to practice language teaching skills in the course? So again, the answer is very simple here, and it's a yes, um, thankfully. Uh, so in terms of opportunities um, to actually practice language teaching skills, uh, it's, not, it's not opportunities to actually teach in a real classroom, but we tend to call, run a lot of sessions that we called uh, micro teaching sessions where students are asked to prepare a lesson plan in the languages of their choice and then to practice that lesson plan with us and then we give uh, feedback for that. Uh, we also encourage our students to um, volunteer. So there is a lot of volunteering opportunities in Edinburgh to teach languages. However, the volunteering opportunities are not compulsory, so they're not part of the program of what you have to do for the program but we support you in looking for these uh, volunteering opportunities and we write you uh, reference letters or anything like that and I can give you as an example this year we have an Italian speaking student who is um, volunteering as an Italian language assistant in one of the best secondary school in Edinburgh uh, we've got uh, six Mandarin speaking students who are volunteering as Mandarin uh, language teachers in uh, primary schools um, in Edinburgh. Um, so yeah, and I can't remember uh, all the rest. So we have a lot of uh, active students who seek their own opportunities as well uh, for teaching uh, languages. Okay, and then lots of information from Aiko. Thank you so much. And I think we'll uh, stop here, mm -hmm. right? All right, yep, thank you very much for coming on. Um, I think it's been wonderful to have a chat with all of you. And hopefully we'll see all of you um, in September. In September. Yeah, so we look forward to meeting you in uh, September. And if you do have any questions, uh, do not hesitate to uh, email me. Uh, so my email is yes, so. uh, like that. It's, uh, I think has actually given your email. All right. Okay. Okay. Right. All the best.